Hey, guy from New Plastic, and after having one of my GPU fail and being out of service for a whole week, the day has finally come to go over each and every one of Octane's nodes. I'm not going to dive too deep into each one, this is more of a surface level type walkthrough, except where I absolutely feel like it's necessary to stall a bit longer on an important node. If you want to support the channel, consider becoming a patron or member. You'll get all these videos with no ads, access to the project files, free products from the Gumroad store, and more cool perks, but mostly help me make more and better content for y'all. Also, check out the new plastic Gumroad store, where you can find all sorts of material packs and model packs. I'm sure you'll find something useful for your work. And if you just want some cool prints and pins I made, check out the Pink Eye Gumroad. That's another great way to support the channel. Follow me on Instagram at ojang or the channel at brand new plastic. Join our Discord, subscribe to the channel, and go out and get some sweat on. Go run, bike, play basketball, anything. Sweat, goddammit. You're sitting down too damn much. Let's go. Okay, so once we're in the node window, if we hover our mouse on the left edge, we can see all the node categories and they're color coded into different categories. We can filter on and off each category by clicking on them here at the top. If you want to clean up your list, sometimes it does happen that my brain glitches out and I can't find a node that's right in front of my eyes. So having a cleaner list makes sense. The first category is all material nodes. Basically each node is a different type of material, which we're not going to go over because this video is not about materials. This sub material node here is a type of material that goes into a composite material. You can see you can't use a regular material in a composite material, so you're going to have to add a sub material to it. It, which has all the same attributes as a regular one. Or you can just click on add material in the composite material node. And material layer is the same thing, but for a layered material node. Okay, let's move on to our actual first node category, the texture nodes, which are used to generate procedural or rasterized source data. First thing, and one of the most important nodes is the image texture node, which is simply how you add an image file to your node system. Once you add it, a pop-up window will come up where you can select the image you're trying to add. You can add JPEGs, PNGs, PSDs, TIFF, CXRs, and pretty much any popular image file. I added the albedo map for this model, and you can see by default, Default, it maps to the object's UVs. And this way you can add any other texture map for basically all the other material channels. So if you look at the node attributes, first we got the file location and all the image details like resolution, color model, and bit depth. If you edit the image outside of Octane and you want Octane to update the changes, just click reload. You can also click edit, which will open the file in the relevant program. Locate will open the folder where the file is located and fit image basically stretches the image to fit the whole UV tile of the model. Power is essentially the brightness of the image, so you can decrease or increase the brightness. You can change the image color space, which you should keep it linear sRGB for pretty much any image you use. The exception is if you know you're importing an image in ACES space. In that case, you can select the ACES options, or you can use the OCIO option, which will use the config.ocio file you imported into your Octane settings. In my case, it's set to AGX. sRGB uses a nonlinear transfer curve to interpret the image. Really, don't ever use it. And non-color data is used for normal maps, and I also use it for EXR displacement maps. When color space is set to linear sRGB plus legacy gamma, the legacy gamma option controls the luminance of the image. Lower numbers increase the luminance and higher decrease it. This is different than brightness. This would be more similar to when you use curves in Photoshop and move around the midpoint of the curve. Invert inverts the color data. Our image is a bit desaturated, so it's hard to tell. Check in linear space invert makes it more apparent as it inverts the gamma correction, so it gets a bit darker. For border, let me add this image to a flat surface and let's up the UV tiling so we get this repeated pattern. The border mode tells Octane how to repeat the pattern along the UV tiles. The default is set to wrap around which just repeats the image. Setting to black color paints the rest of the tiles black along either the U or the V axis of the UV map. Setting to white paints them white. Clamp takes the very last single pixel row and repeats it along the tiles. And mirror flips every other tile instead of just repeating it as is. In type, the normal settings makes Octane read the image as an RGB image, even if you have a grayscale image. So if you do have a grayscale image, change the type to float. This way Octane doesn't have to spend VRAM resources on reading three different color channels for each image and just reads one luminance channel. Alpha uses the alpha channel in your image, if it has any, and paints it black. Our image doesn't have any alpha data, so it's all white, but if you have it, you can use that black alpha information on the opacity channel to mask out your model. This is mainly used for stuff like decals. 
This automatic option tells Octane to automatically decide how to compress your image. 4-bit will heavily compress your image and ignore the alpha channel. 8-bit faster has reasonable compression and includes alpha channel. And 8-bit high quality has better compression and includes alpha channel as well. Just leave it as automatic. Let me remove this transform node. So here you can add a UV transform node and a projection node. Let's start with the projection node. This tells Octane how to project the texture on top of your model. By default, it's set to using the UVs of your model. And if you have other UV sets, you can change them here, but you can choose other type projections. Some are the familiar box, cylinder, perspective, sphere, etc. OSL delayed UVs is sometimes needed for some OSL scripts to work. Triplanar, we'll look at this later on. XYZ to UVW, which is one of the most useful ones. And I'll quickly add a noise so you can understand better what it does. So if I set this noise to mesh UVs, it looks fine, but you can see it gets chopped where the UV islands end on the UV seams. But if I set the projection to XYZ to UVW, it's like the name suggests translating the position planes into UVW coordinates and perfectly wraps the noise around with no seams or stretches. And I can use these transform parameters to further edit the texture so I can rotate it around the Z and Y and X axis. I can scale it uniformly with the lock aspect ratio enabled or disable the lock and scale each axis individually. And I can move the texture along each axis. All these transform type options here, we're gonna look at in a second. Then color to UVW uses the black and white values of a different texture to distort this texture. But a better version is the distort mesh UVs, which is doing the same thing, but gives you way more options to control how the texture is being distorted. So real quick, if I add another noise with a different scale and plug it into the translation, I can control the amount the black and white areas of that noise are moving the original noise around resulting in this extra distortion. You wanna choose different inputs for the X and the Y. If they're the same number, the distortion won't be visible. And also very, very small numbers here go a long way. And you can do the same for the scale and rotation of the original noise. Okay, let's move on. Um, let's get rid of these noises, use this original image and set it to mesh UVs. Let's look at the transform node. First, we have the reset button, which will reset everything to the default values. You can control the rotation on the different axes here, but you can see that it's not doing anything. That's because it's using the UVs to transform the texture. So it only really rotates the 2D tile of the UVs. So only the Z rotation works. Scale works and X and Y position work. But again, the Z position doesn't work because it's only moving along the U and V lines of the UV map. Okay, another thing we can do here is add another object as a link and then the transform values of that object will affect these values. So I'll use this cube here and if I reset its PSR, the texture is at its default state. When I rotate the cube, the texture of the skull rotates with it. Really cool. Same when I move it, but again, not on the Z axis, only X and Y. And the scale link doesn't work for some reason. Now let's look at different transform types. The default is transform value. Then we got 2D transform, which will pretty much be the same now because transforming along the UVs is essentially a 2D transform. We got 3D rotation, which affects only the rotation and you can change the axis rotation order. But honestly, I just never see it making any difference. You got 3D scale, which affects only the scale and you got 3D transform, which is essentially the same as the default transform value. Now, if you want to control the values along the 3D axis and not along the UVs, we just need to change the projection type. And honestly, at this point, just use the projection node to transform these values. But now you'll be able to transform on all the axes. Lastly, about the image texture node, I removed the image so it's all black and I'll use this plane here, which you can barely see. There's another tab in this node called animation, which allows us to input an image sequence and have an animated texture. To do that, I'll use this image sequence of the animation I made with the Travis Scott toy figure and I'll add the very first image in the sequence. It's a bit dark, but eh, it doesn't matter right now. If we look at the animation tab, first we have mode where you can choose if we want the animation to play and stop, to loop or ping pong loop. The timing we'll look at in a second. And here we need to tell Octane how long the sequence is and what's the frame rate. I can simply click on calculate and let Octane try and find out the information for itself. And that's where the naming of your file is really important. In my case, I accidentally added two at the end of each file name. So when the sequence was created, it added the sequence number after two. So the first frame is 200 instead of 00, and the last frame is 260 instead of 60. So Octane thinks I have 260 frames. Doesn't matter, I'll just manually enter 200 at the start frame and 260 at the end frame, because that's the names of my files. I'll change the frame rate to 30, but I think Octane automatically matches the frame rate to your project's frame rate. And if we play it now, you can see 
speed animation is happening as a texture on our plane. Once it hits frame 60, it stops. So I can set it to loop, then it'll loop after it's frame 60. Timing set to exact frame will force the animation to play at the frame rate set in my project, even if the animation has a different frame rate, which can affect the speed of the animation. Exact second will try to keep the same speed of the original animation regardless of the project's frame rate. And with range, you can dictate exactly when the animation starts and stops playing within your timeline. So if I tell it to start at 20 and end at 80, the animation will only start at frame 20. If I tell it to stop at 40, it'll only play the first 20 frames. Now, I would only use a JPEG sequence here. Octane says that using PNGs will take more resources and will be a bit more slow because it needs to decompress the PNGs or whatever. Just use JPEGs, don't use PNGs. Okay, on to the next one. Here we have the RGB spectrum node, which is essentially just a simple RGB color node. Next, we have the float node, which is a grayscale node from zero black to one white, but you can also use this node as a value output. So sometimes you can choose whichever number you want here and plug it into another node that requires a numerical value, keeping your workflow very modular and procedural. Next, we got the Gaussian spectrum node. And let me turn on this floor here for a second. Cool. So the Gaussian spectrum node is another way to get color, but instead of using the RGB spectrum, we're using the Gaussian spectrum. This spectrum corresponds to the visible light spectrum. So you can see that the spectrum consists of the wavelength, which goes from purple all the way to red, then the width, which dictates how wide the selection of the wavelength we want to use, and the power, which dictates the strength of the wave, which essentially is the brightness. If you ever worked with a parametric EQ, it's basically the same idea, except with light waves instead of sound waves. Waves. So you can see we got the exact same parameters here, the wavelength, which at one is set to red. If the width is too wide, it'll blend the surrounding colors as well, so it makes it more orange. If it's too narrow, then we just get black. So we need to find some kind of a low number that fits the level of color purity we're looking for. And power is brightness. Now you may ask, why should I use this confusing thing instead of just choosing a color in the RGB spectrum? RGB spectrum is more familiar and easy to use, but Octane actually uses the Gaussian spectrum to produce colors. So even when you use an RGB spectrum, Octane eventually converts it to Gaussian spectrum. So by using the Gaussian spectrum directly, you're jumping over that conversion and potentially have more accurate control over your colors. And where this truly shines, no pun intended, is when you're trying to use colored lights. So I'll add a texture emission node, which we'll go over later, and plug the Gaussian node to the texture channel. So the thing about light is that it adds a level of complexity to how the color is perceived visually. It's not just a passive reflection of a wavelength, but there's more to it. So that means a lot more room for inaccuracy and distorted colors. So the best practice when it comes to using colored lights is to use the Gaussian spectrum node because it'll reduce the amount of color shifting and inaccuracy of your colored light. Okay, next, the baking texture node. This node allows us to bake a procedural texture into a bitmap image texture. So let's quickly plug in a procedural noise to it, which we'll go over later. And you can see now we have our input texture here. We can enable or disable it with this checkbox. We can set the resolution of the baked image, set how many samples will be dedicated to render each pixel. I usually just leave it as is. We can set the type to low dynamic range or high dynamic range. The HDR will give us a linear interpolation between the blacks and the whites and just give us different results. So you can feel free to test out both options. I usually use this to bake black and white procedural textures, but if you wanna bake a colored texture, you can enable RGB baking. Power is brightness, gamma is luminance, same as the image texture node, and you can invert the baked image which doesn't really work as expected, I just add an invert node before the baking texture node if I need to invert it. You can add transform or projection nodes and dictate how the UV repetition will look like, just like the image texture. One of the most useful cases for this node is in texture displacement. You can see that if I plug in the procedural noise, the texture displacement doesn't interpret it because it can only use rasterized data. If I plug the baking texture node, now the displacement is working. There are known limitations about this, like tear outs on the UV seams and misaligned projections, but you can get a ton of procedural displacement detail this way while using very, very low resources compared to the vertex displacement, which can read procedural data. We'll go over it later. Okay, next, image tiling. 
This allows us to use UDIMs. So I added this face model that has UDIMs with two UV tiles. And you can see here the two different image files used for it. I'll add the first one, usually named 1001. Then in the grid size, I'll tell Octane I have two UV tiles. And then I'll hit find pattern. And there you go. Octane automatically tiles the two UV tiles and use them as texture. I'll change the color space here to linear sRGB. And you can see if I tell Octane there is only one tile, it'll paint the second tile black. We can see the name of the tiles here, even though it's wrong. But if I hit reload, it fixes the names, just a little bug. Power and gamma are the same as the image texture node, and the empty tile color is the color Octane will paint the mesh if you have an empty tile. Next, the attribute node. With this node, we can reference the vertex map tags or vertex color tags to use in our material. Let me switch to this cube model, and you can see it has this gradient vertex map from one plane to another. I can drag this vertex map tag into the name slot, change type to float since vertex maps are grayscale, and you can see we're getting this black and white gradient, which we can use to colorize, mask things out, mix different nodes together, etc. If you have any vertex map information from X particles or RealFlow or Houdini, this is how you can use it in the material to colorize stuff like different particles or density or velocity maps of your fluid simulation. Another thing we can do is drag a vertex color tag to the name slot, change type back to color, and now if you have any vertex color information, you can colorize your model with it. That's really cool, for example, if you have imported a model with unbaked poly paint information from ZBrush, which with this node you can use like an image texture. Just know that this won't work on the displacement channel. The displacement is processed before the vertex map is being read, so you can't use it for displacement. Silverwing has a great video exploring this node. Okay, next we have the W coordinate, which allows Octane to access mapping information along the W coordinate, which you can look at as the third or the Z axis of a UV map. The real place where this node shines is on hair. So if I quickly add a hair object here, you can see once I apply the UV coordinate, it paints a black and white gradient along each hair strand. Then I can use this information to give it color, mask it out, etc. Last one of the texture nodes is the comment node. This one is used simply to organize your node system and is super useful when you have a really intricate system with lots of different sections. So you can see I can frame the exact nodes I want the comment to affect and now I can move all of them along with the comment. I can edit the title, I can add a more detailed comment here, change the background color and opacity as well as the border and you can also remove the text altogether and just use the border and background for clear separation of different node clumps. If I want to only move the comment, I can scale it back down and move it without affecting the nodes. Next, we have the generator node category, which are basically procedurally generated image data. First, we have the checks node, which is just a checkerboard pattern. Only thing you can do here is adjust to transform and projection. Next node we have is the curvature node, which is basically procedural ambient occlusion mapping with three different modes. Concave, which paints the crevices white, convex, which paints the edges white, and all, which combines both of them. If I set the mode to concave, I can turn the strength up to make it more pronounced. If I change it to convex, you can see that the white is spreading all over the model, so we can bring down the radius, which is directly related to the size of your model. You can see we just get these subtle white edges. With offset, I can kind of move the calculated effect along the surface. Tolerance dictates the degree threshold of a bent surface to be calculated for the effect. So higher tolerance will only consider very extremely curved edges, while lower tolerance will paint surfaces that are just slightly bent. Sometimes you'll get weird artifacts along surfaces you don't want the effect to apply on, so you can crank up the tolerance. And spread is essentially the contrast of the effect, so lower spread kind of clamps the transition between the black and the white. Now if include object mode is set to all, the curvature will apply on areas where different objects intersect. If it's set to self, the effect will only be applied within each object and not on the intersections. Invert normal reverses the normal directions of the model, essentially treating your concave surface as convex and vice versa. And again, selecting the all mode paints both your crevices and your edges white. And lastly, you have the radius map, where you can plug any type of black and white noise or imperfection map and break up the smoothness of the effect. It basically acts like a mask where the black parts of your mask will hide the curvature effect and the white parts will show it. So you can see as I increase the contrast on the mask, we get more breakup of the effect and without it, it's all smooth and white. 
Next, we have the Dirt node, which is an older and less complex version of the Curvature node, which honestly, I still tend to use more than Curvature. It uses a different type of calculation to create this effect, and sometimes it just works better. The Dirt node paints the crevices black, and if I increase the strength, you can see the effect more intensely. Increasing the details further intensifies the effect, especially on smaller crevices, and overall darkens the blacks even more. Radius dictates the spread of the effect, very dependent on your model scale. Radius map, tolerance, and spread are the same as in the curvature node. Distribution further makes the effect more or less defined within the spread amount that you set. So if we compare, the left side has distribution set to 100, and the right side has distribution set to 1. Higher distribution values will reduce the fall off within the spread, but will increase the darkness of the blacks. Lower distribution will create a larger fall off, but reduce the darkness. Bias has three inputs that correlate to X, Y, and Z directions, which help shift the direction from which the effect will be more pronounced. That's a very dumbed down description of what's really going on, and I don't want to dive into this rabbit hole, but essentially, as you change these values, you can see the effect kind of shifts around along these axes, as seen from the camera. This parameter depends on your distribution settings, and also generally on the topology of your model, so sometimes you might not even see any difference when you change these numbers. Bias coordinate space dictates how the previous bias direction will be calculated. The default is by the normal direction, but you can also choose object space, which will be calculated from the internal axis point of the model, or world space, which will be calculated from the 0, 0, 0 point of the overall scene. And invert normal basically reverses the effect, applying it on the edges instead of the crevices. Next, the fall off node. This creates a white and black gradient from the back to the front of the model, by default set to normal versus eye ray, which is dependent on the camera angle. So no matter where you look at the model from, the gradient will come from the back to the front. Upping the minimum value will reduce the intensity of the blacks at the front of the model, lowering the maximum value will reduce the intensity of the white coming from the back of the model. Changing the fall off skew moves the gradient bias towards more of the whites at lower values or more towards the blacks at higher values. Changing the fall off direction isn't doing anything in this model since the direction depends on the camera angle. But if we change the mode to vector 90 degrees, now we're getting a gradient from the top of the model, which is not camera dependent. So the gradient will stick to the top of the model and now we can change the bias on all three axes to shift the direction of the gradient spread. This is great for stuff like dust or snow or any dirt that tends to settle on top of things. Changing the mode to vector 180 degrees is similar to the default option, making the gradient from the back to the front however here it's not camera dependent so it'll stick to the model no matter where you look at it from and changing the bias will also shift the spread around the model from different directions next we got the instance color node for this i'll use this cloner object with all these cubes if source is set to particles, I get access to the particles in my object. If you're using a cloner, just make sure your instance mode is set to either render or multi-instance, and not the default instance, otherwise it won't work. Now, for example, I have this random effector on this cloner, and it's only set to apply a custom color. I also have this linear falloff field, and if I turn them on, nothing happens, but if I drag the cloner object to the node's color source, it gets access to the color information and can use it to paint the cloner. That's because the color mode is set to display color, but you can choose any parameter of your particle system if you're using the default particle emitter or X particles, for example, and use it to colorize your particles by those parameters. In the source, I can also select a file and upload an image that will be applied on the overall cloner. The way this works is that each cloned object is taking the color of a single pixel from the image. So in my case, I have 400 clones, which means the cloner is only using 400 pixels out of the whole image. If you want your whole image to fit your cloner, you need to have the exact same pixel amount as your cloner amount. So a 40 by 40 cloner will need a 40 by 40 pixel image. Next, we have instance range. And this node paints a black and white gradient along each clone, according to the clone ID. So right now, the maximum ID is set to zero, which only gives us black and white clones. Again, make sure your cloner is set to render or multi-instance mode. But once we increase the max ID to two, we start to get a middle gray one as well. And as we increase the max IDs, we get more and more grayscale values in between the black and the white clones, until you reach the maximum amount of clones in your cloner, which will make the first one black and the last one white and everything in between a gradient grayscale. And of course you can add a gradient node to it and give it some color which we will go over later. Next we have the instance highlight which paints a single clone in your cloner object a specified color according to its cloner 
ID. So you can see the highlight color is set to white and regular color is set to black. We can change both colors. And if I change instance ID, the highlighted color shifts along each clone. Next, we have the object layer color node which simply paints the object according to the color set in the object color in its octane tag. Next, we have the marble node. And actually, let's turn on this plane for this. This node produces this mix of a striped gradient and a turbulence fractal noise. I can add a transform node to scale it down, change its brightness with the power settings, shift the striped gradient position with offset, reduce or increase the detail of the fractal noise with the omega setting, reduce or increase the mix between the striped gradient and the fractal noise with the variance setting, and use the octaves as sort of a multiplier of the omega detail settings. So higher octaves will increase the amount of potential details in the omega settings. Next, we have the Noise 4D node. This node uses the native Cinema 4D in an OSL-based procedural way. So we have all the familiar Cinema 4D noises here. With octaves, we can change the scale of the details. With lacunarity, we can change how much detail each octave level has. And I must say, these values don't work as expected for every noise. Some noises are just not that affected by these values. And I think it's just a bug with Octane. Gain changes the exposure level of each level of details. Global scale changes the overall scale of the noise. Relative scale changes the scale of each axis, X, Y, and Z. We can add a transform and projection node, and we can evolve the noise using the time value, which we can also keyframe and animate an evolving noise. Enabling absolute makes the noise have absolute values, which means the float values can only be positive. So you can see any float value that might be negative and kind of blacker than black are clamped to zero and upwards. Enabling and disabling the use 4D noise toggles the noise between a 2D noise and a 4D noise. There's no way I can get into the difference between the two now, but just know that the 4D noise calculates values on all three axes along with a fourth dimension, which is time. So it's not only more intricate, it can be used on volumes and not just on surfaces. Sample radius sets the radius used to calculate the noise detail, and you can look at it almost as blurring the noise. Again, some of these settings only work on specific noises. And C changes the random seed calculation for the noise. Next, we have one of my most used and favorite nodes, the native Octane Noise node, which is, in my opinion, the best and most stable noise in Octane. Again, we have Power's Brightness. We can select the different noise types from the default Perlin, Turbulent, Circular, Chips, or Voronoi. Octave sets the scale of the details. Omega sets the amount of detail on each octave level, so they're both dependent on each other. If octaves is all the way down, Omega won't have any effect, and vice versa. If Omega is all the way down, the octaves won't have any effect. But if you set low levels of octaves and up the Omega, you're gonna get many, many small but clean details. And if you set high octaves and lower Omega values, you'll get larger details with increasing levels of micro complexity as you increase the Omega. And high levels of both will result in this extremely rich and detailed noise. Invert inverts the black and white values. Gamma changes the luminance values, so lower gamma will result in larger white areas and high gamma will result in larger black areas. And contrast increases the sharpness and overall contrast of the noise, reducing the amount of gray values. I truly love all these noises and you can get a huge variety of looks just using all these different options. Okay, next, the random color node. Let's bring back the cloned cubes for this. So the random color node simply paints your cloned objects or particles in a random variety of grayscale values. All you can do is change the random seeds of the values. Again, you have to make sure you're using the render or multi-instance options in your cloner. And you can also use these on Cinema 4D instances. Next, we have the rigid fractal node, one of the ugliest noise patterns Octane has. Power is brightness, offset kind of shifts around the values and slowly inverts them. Lacunarity sets the scale of the details and octaves sets the level of details and they're both dependent on each other. And of course, you can add a transform and projection node. I really never use this noise, I low-key hate it. But honestly, uh, maybe I can think of uses for it like tiny blood vessels or mycelium networks or whatnot. Anyway, next we have the sine wave node which creates this clean repeating striped gradient. If I scale it down, you can see it more clearly. And for example, I can plug a different texture like a noise texture into the offset input to break it up. I can also change the projection to create different spread patterns. For example, if I set it to spherical projection and then in the transform node, rotate around the, um, rotate around the Y axis, I get these circular stripes. 
Another thing we can do here is change the type from sine to triangle, which gives us these harsh linear transitions. So you can see the sine wave is way smoother than the triangle. And we can also make it a saw wave, which alternates from smooth to harsh transition. Cool stuff. Okay, next we have the side node. This node simply paints the front side of your polygon white and its back side black. So if I look at the back of this plane, you can see now it's black. And we can use this black and white mapping to give different colors to the sides using a gradient node or assign different textures to the front and the back side of a surface using the mix node, which we'll go over later. Next, the turbulence noise. Another ugly noise I barely use and all the settings are the same as other noises. Power is brightness, offset shifts the values, octave sets the detail scale, omega sets the amount of details on each octave. Use turbulence adds this extra layer of turbulent noise, invert, inverts the values, and gamma changes luminance. Next. Lastly, in the generator nodes, we have the color key node, which lets us key out specific colors or color ranges. This is commonly known as chroma keying, same method you use to remove green screens. To make it work, you'll need to plug in the texture you're trying to remove a color from into the input slot and nothing is happening because now we need to use this key color to select which color we want to remove. So I'll take this color pick here and click on this brown area of the image and immediately you'll see it replacing it with a black color, which is dictated by this fill color here. So I can change it to any color I want or plug another texture into the fill key slot. Changing the high and low falloffs changes the range of the color I want to remove. So higher and lower falloff will start removing more and more areas of that color. And computational gamma changes the bias curve of that range. U high low and V high low cutoffs basically set the cutoff of the removal of the color on the U and the V direction. So we're kind of choking in the filled in color along the UV maps. And I can also plug some noise or other textures into the mask slot to add more variation to the key out. Okay, next one we got is the color space conversion node. Let me paste an image texture in and plug it into the texture slot. Once we have an image plugged in, we can convert this image to different color models. So RGB data can be converted to HSL, which uses hue, saturation, and lightness. HSV, which is hue, saturation, and value. Perpetual RGB, which is sort of a non-linear RGB. I'm not going to explain each one of these since I'm too ignorant for that, and it's going to take a whole deep dive of its own. Okay, on to the next category, the mapping nodes. All these are used to procedurally mix and modify textures. First we have the add node, super useful, you can blend two textures using the add blend mode, which basically uses the bright parts of the top texture to increase the brightness of the bottom texture. This is also known as linear dodge. Next one is the clamp texture node. Here we can plug a texture into the texture slot and basically clamp its black and white values between 1 and 0. As we know, sometimes black values can have negative float values and white can have float values over 1, so this just clamps them. And we can also plug RGB spectrum nodes into the min and max slots to colorize the black and white areas of the texture. Next one is the color correction node. Another one of those super useful nodes, if we plug the image texture into the texture node, we can now adjust its brightness, invert it, shift the hues, change the saturation, change the luminance with the gamma, kind of like adjusting the curves in Photoshop, change the contrast, change the gain, which is basically the same as the brightness, change the exposure, which does the same as the brightness, but slightly different, and reducing the mask, simply is a general knob that reduces all these settings altogether. And you can add a different texture into the brightness slot to add variation to the brightness. Okay, next, image adjustment, which is basically a more robust version of the color correction node. Let's start with the channel mapping section. We need to turn on this section, and then we just tell Octane which channels of the image to show. So if we set all the channels to red, we get a black and white version of the red channel, and the same for all the other channels. You can also choose the inverse channels or the luminance channels. If you ever do any channel work in Photoshop, this is for you. Then we got the brightness adjustment, same as the color correction node, but we have lift, which brightens the whites when increased and darkens the blacks when decreased. Pivot shifts the point where the contrast is happening, so high pivot increases the contrast on the dark areas and low pivot increases the contrast on the bright areas. And we got gamma, and we can inverse the way the gamma slider affects it. Then we got color adjustment, hue shift and saturation works the same as the color correction node, but we can also add a tint color and increase the strength to kind of colorize the whole image with this color. Then we got output tint, 
where we can change the tint of the shadows, mids, and highlights. And with mid-tone luminance, we can kind of shift where it registers the mid-levels of the image to be. And clamp does the same as the clamp texture, where you can clamp the values of the blacks and the whites to anywhere between 0 and 1. Lastly, if we turn on color adjustment and change the hue shift, we can go turn on this hue range section and select a specific hue range within the image on which this hue shift will take effect. So if I pick one of these brown tones, the hue shift will only apply to them and I can extend the range to slowly make it affect more or less of the surrounding colors. So yeah, very detailed editing. Next node is the jitter color correction, which is the same as the color correction node, except here we set a range for each parameter and Octane randomly changes the values of those parameters within that range. And then we can play with the seed and get different random variations of all parameters we set the range for. Next node is the compare node, where we take two textures and use an operation to blend between them using a true false statement. So let's plug our image texture to input one and this noise to input two and an RGB spectrum to the if true slot. And you can see the RGB color replacing the whites in the noise. And if we look at the operation, we're basically telling Octane, if the data in input A is lower than input B, replace it with this RGB color. And because the noise in input B has pure white color, which is the highest data value, and the image texture in input A doesn't have pretty much any pure white, then the operation is true. The color of input A is indeed lower than the white areas of input B, and therefore in those areas, this RGB color will show. But you can see that the pure black values of input B are lower than input A, so it's not painting that RGB color. Instead, it's showing whatever is in the if false slot, which has nothing in it, so it paints it black. But let's say we can input the image texture into the if if false slot as well, and now we're painting those areas back with the image texture. Now, if I use the gradient node to slowly make the blacks of the noise brighter and brighter, the values are getting higher and higher, and once they become higher than input A, the RGB color will start showing there as well. So yeah, you can create these sophisticated blends that depend on the values of the existing inputs and choose different operations or different rules for this node to abide by. Next node is the cosine mix node, Let's plug this noise into the amount, plug the image to texture 2, and what's happening is the whites from this noise are exposing texture 2 and the blacks from this noise are exposing texture 1. So if I plug an RGB color to texture 1, you can see where the noise is black, we get this RGB color, and where it's white, we get the image texture. And if I unplug the noise, we have this slider to control the amount of how much each texture is showing and mixing together. The reason it's called a cosine mix is because the curve used to mix between them is a cosine wave. Instead of a linear one. So you can see as the mix starts, it takes a little longer to really start mixing, then gets to a perfect 50-50 mix in the middle, then starts biasing faster into the second texture, and close to one, it's almost completely biased towards texture two. So the rate of the mixing changes between the different values, unlike a linear mix where the rate of the mixing always stays the same. Okay, next one, the invert node, which simply inverts the color values of the input. Then we have the mix node, which is the exact same node as the cosine mix, except it's using a linear mix curve. It's a bit hard to see the differences, but if we bring in a cosine mix and use the exact same amount values for each one, you can see that any values in the middle look exactly the same between both nodes. But if we get close to one, you can see the cosine mix is more biased towards texture two. So you see less of the red. While in the regular mix node, you still see some of the red there. Okay, next is the multiply node. Super useful, simply blends two textures using the multiply blend, which uses the blacks from the top texture to decrease the brightness of the bottom texture. It's like the opposite of add node. Next is the octane gradient node, which might be the most used and useful nodes in this whole system. Uh, definitely one of the most. You can use this node to remap the color values into the values of the gradient. So dark values of the texture will be black and bright values of the texture will be white or any other color you choose in the gradient. You can also use this to change the contrast of a texture by bringing in the gradient notches, clipping the values of the texture, kind of like using levels in Photoshop. And here's one of the many, many, many examples of how I use this node. I'll use a mix node, plug this noise into texture two, and I'll plug the same noise to the amount 
using a gradient node and some color to texture one. Now I'll make the noise really low contrast. So we're getting all these grayscale values, but the gradient, I'll first of all make full black and full white and then really bring in the notches. So we're really crushing all the gray values and just end up with harsh black to white transition. So if I solo the noise, you can see it's very blurry and not sharp. I'll even reduce the details on it. And on the gradient, I'll actually pull the notches more towards the left. So we're pushing more whites into the blacks and reducing the size of the black parts. And now you can see, let's make this texture one color white. You can see we created this very unique look just by masking out the noise with a very sharp version of itself. So we cut out the inner parts of each black area, but we keep all that detailed grayscale fall off. Octane gradient, very useful. Next one is the subtract node, which uses the bright areas from the top texture to subtract color data from the bottom texture. Basically makes it darker and even inverts it if the subtraction is strong enough. Okay, next one, the triplanar node. Let me actually add a checker pattern to it and scale it down. So you can see the checker pattern matches the UV maps. But let's say we don't have the UV tags, we don't have UV maps now. The pattern can't map itself onto the model. You can choose different projections for it, but what the triplanar does is basically create this invisible box around the model and projects the texture on the model from each plane of the box. So right now it's set to single texture, which will just use the same texture from all sides of the cube. But if we uncheck it, we can apply different textures from each plane. So let's just plug this checkerboard to each plane and you can see nothing is showing. And that's because we need to add a triplanar projection node to the texture. And bam, this texture is now projected from each plane of this invisible cube. To blur the seams between each plane, you can increase the blend angle value or keep it sharp. Depends on the look you're going for. And if we plug a different texture to one of the planes, you can see the texture is now projected from that plane. Okay, last node of the mapping nodes is the precious UVW transform. Another super useful node, crucial for heavy procedural work. And let me demonstrate with a mix node. I'll plug this checkerboard to the amount and I'll add an octane noise to texture two scale it down and as we learned about the mix node the white parts of the checkerboard are showing texture 2 which is the noise and the black parts of the checkerboard show texture 1 which is white now if i want another larger noise in texture 1 i can just add another noise and scale it up but i can plug this existing noise into the uvw transform node and plug that into texture one. Now I can add a separate transform node and get a separate layer of the same noise with a different scale, rotation, or position. So we're getting two noises for the price of one. And even though using one or two noises in your system wouldn't make a difference, once you start stacking up many noises to create super complex textures, they start to take a toll on your resources. So whenever you can, it's always a good habit to reuse existing noises that are already calculated. And with the UVW transform, we can do that while adding very to them instead of having to calculate new separate noise nodes. Okay, I think I should stop here. We're barely halfway through and this is already becoming way longer than I expected. So I'll save the rest for the next video. Hope you discovered some new nodes you might like and use. I feel like these first few nodes categories are more accessible and familiar, but as we go down the list, they'll get more and more obscure. So stay tuned for the next video. Check out the Gumroad store for cool material and model packs. Check out the other Gumroad store for prints and pins. Consider supporting on Patreon. And as always, an absolutely big W to all my breathtaking patrons and members you see on the screen right now. I love you. Have a great day. Peace.